Good morning, New Life. Good morning. Would you please join me in standing this morning? So I want you to imagine with me stepping into a room and every corner of that room echoes with joy and every heart is filled with gratitude and every voice is blended together into a beautiful symphony of praise and I want you to imagine standing there feeling disconnected almost as though you're on the outside looking in and you're longing for an experience with God you're longing to partake in an intimacy with him but there's this disconnect well this morning I want to share with you the secret that bridges that gap and it's found in a small simple transformative word with can you say that with me with Psalms 100 says come into his presence with singing enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise that preposition is a preposition of accompaniment and it means that if you're going to someone's house you take something with you and so when you enter into the house of the Lord you are to come with singing with thanksgiving and with praise but don't miss this that preposition is also a preposition of instrumentality and it indicates the means by which the manner by which the method by which we carry out an action and so singing is a means by which we enter into the presence of God giving thanks is an instrument by which we enter in to the presence of God praising is an instrument a means a manner by which we enter into the presence of Almighty God and so singing is not just making a melody but it is a conduit of connection giving thanks is not just an expression of gratitude but it is a bridge to the very heart of God praising God is not just some spontaneous outburst of joy no it allows it transports you into the very presence of Almighty God and so is anybody here to sing to the Lord this morning we got an amazing praise team but don't you let them sing for you don't you let someone around you thank him for you don't let the people around you praise him for you no you put your hands together you open up your mouth you sing to him a song of victory and you will experience him in a way you won't feel connect disconnected you will feel him right here with you and so let us invite him in Lord we come to you this morning to say thank you thank you for waking us up this morning thank you for starting us on our way thank you for the clothes on our back thank you for the shoes on our feet thank you for your grace and your mercy thank you for every bullet that missed us thank you for every accident that didn't take us out we thank you father we thank you for the blood of Jesus we thank you for the way you've made for us we thank you oh father and we ask you to have your way in this place Holy Spirit move in this place we need your presence today oh God if you don't show up we're just performing if you don't show up we're just actors on a stage if you don't show up this is just a social club if you don't show up we are lost and so Holy Spirit have your way in this place today move heal deliver set free have your way save somebody today in Jesus name in Jesus name in Jesus name come on and put your hands together church let's bless him in the name of Jesus can we just lift up the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords oh magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together his name together is anybody glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning I think we're ready for the presence of God to fall just one more time would you lift your hands and lift your voices and let's welcome the King of Kings into this room let's welcome the King of Glory into this room have 
Thank you. Hallelujah. I'm excited this morning because we're going to sing that the victory is sure and the fight is fixed. Listen, if God is for you, no one can stand against you. Are you ready to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords this morning? It's already done. It's already won. Let's go.
Now, I need... I, I need you to understand something. Because some of you are standing here like this is just a nice, cute little song. You don't understand something. There is a very real force of darkness. His name is Satan. He is the devil. And the Bible refers to him as the ruler of the kingdoms of the air. A spiritual force of evil. And he is roaming around like a lion seeking someone to devour. Jesus says he comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. He has been attacking you and your family. You can't see him, but you feel him. He's trying to destroy your marriage. He's trying to destroy your children. He's trying to attack your body. He is in our schools. He is in our government. He is all around us, and he's trying to take you and me out. And he's been telling somebody here that you ought to give up. He's been telling you that you ought to put that gun in your mouth and take your own life. He's telling you that you ought to keep doing those drugs and get He's telling you that your marriage can never be fixed. He's telling you that your children will never be saved. But in the name of Jesus, I stand here as a soldier in the army of the Lord telling you that the devil is a liar. He is a liar. Jesus on that cross said it is finished. It is finished. His power over you is finished. His authority over you is done. Every battle you fight, every mountain you climb, everything you need is in the name of Jesus. Oh! It's in the name of Jesus. And so I dare you, I dare you to open your mouth and praise him. I dare you to lift up your hands and call Chains will break. Chains will break. Oh, Jesus. Jesus. Oh, Jesus. In the name of Jesus, chains have to fall. In the name of Jesus, marriages can be restored. In the name of of Jesus children can be saved in the name of Jesus bodies can be healed in the name of Jesus someone close to me this week a leader a family man tried to kill himself the enemy is busy and so when they seeing that the victory is won the fight is fixed the outcome is established in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus and so father we come to you in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus and we say thank you. We stand in awe at the power and authority that you bestow upon the name of Jesus, our Savior, our King, and our Redeemer. Oh, Lord, it's in the name of Jesus that we pray for salvation, trusting in your power to set somebody free today, to save somebody today. There's somebody here who's about to give up. Fathers, save them in Jesus' name. We pray for healing, Father. We pray that you touch that sick body because at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. At the name of Jesus, bodies are healed and wellness is restored at the name of Jesus. Father, we stand here declaring victory over every chain and stronghold. Oh, Lord, may the bonds of addiction and, and, and despair and anxiety fall. Oh, Lord. And may you calm the storms, calm the storms. 
and give us a peace that surpasses all understanding. We pray for forgiveness this morning for every sin we've committed, for everything we've done that we should not have done, for everything we did not do that we should have done. Cleanse us, Father. Purify us and pull us closer to you. In the name of Jesus, Father, we thank you for the assurance that when we call on you at the name of Jesus, that you hear us, that miracles happen, that the lost are restored, we thank you. We worship you. We honor you. We magnify you. We open up our mouths, God. We offer this prayer to you. In that name that loved us enough to die for us, who rose for us, and who will one day come back again for us. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen and amen and amen. Hallelujah. Oh, he's good. Has he been good to you? Has he blessed you? Has he brought you through? Has he sat with you in the midnight hour? Oh, we love you, Jesus. We honor you. We magnify you. Oh, my brothers, my sisters, if you can, if you can, you can take your seats in the presence of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I, I wasn't trying to do all that today. But when I start thinking about Jesus and all he's done for me and what I've seen him do, him do in your life, my soul cries out. Hallelujah. And so, as we transition to this holy sacrament, um, it's because of what he did at that cross that enabled him to do all the things we just talked about. To heal, to save to deliver, to restore. At the cross, he trampled down death. He destroyed the gates of hell. He brought evil to its knees. A professor of mine, Dr. Robert Coleman, when I was in seminary, told this story, and I want to share it with you to help you understand the significance of Jesus' sacrifice. He told the story of this little boy named Johnny whose sister needed a blood transfusion. And the doctor explained to him that, Johnny, the sickness that you overcame two years ago, your little sister now has. And the only way to save her life is for her to receive a blood transfusion from someone who has conquered this disease. And Johnny, you and your sister have a perfect match. Johnny, would you give your blood to your sister? And Johnny sat there silently for a minute, and his bottom lip started to quiver. He said, for my sister? Sure, I'll do it. And so... On the day of the transfusion, they wheeled Johnny and his sister Mary into the, into the room, and they were both quiet. And Mary was sitting there weak and frail, and little Johnny was sitting there healthy and strong. They didn't say a word to each other.
But when their eyes met, he just smiled at her. And when the nurse put the needle into his arm, that little smile began to fade. And he felt strength leaving his body. And he looked at the tube and he saw his blood leaving his body going through the tube. And a tear rolled down his face. And he looked at the nurse. He looked at the doctor, rather. He said, when am I going to die? The doctor, surprised, said, now, sweetie, you're not going to die. You're not going to die. You're going to be all right. But it hit the doctor that Johnny thought that giving his blood meant giving his life. Fortunately, Johnny didn't have to die to save his sister. But you and I, however, had another condition that required Jesus to not only give his blood, but he gave his very life. We have this condition, this, this sickness, this, this malady, this, this virus that has infected our minds and our hearts and our souls, and it's corrupted us, and it's damaged our relationships, and it's caused us to become something other than what God intended for us. And Jesus' sacrifice on that cross paid for a sin debt that he did not owe for you and for me. And so when we take this bread, it symbolizes that body that was broken for us. And we, we drink this cup, it symbolizes that blood that was shed for you and for me. And so before we partake in this holy sacrament, I want us to reflect on the beautiful words of this song and reflect on not the sins that he died for for everybody else, but think about the ones you committed. It's easy to talk about all of the sin out there, but what about the sin in here? What about the hatred and the jealousy and the envy and the lust and the evil in here? He died for that. So let us reflect, let us worship, and then we'll partake. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken, so great are you. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only, to you only, to the only one who is worthy. again. See, great are you, Lord. See, it's your breath. Raise your voice. It's your breath. Sing, church.
on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread. If you peel back that cover and pull out the bread and lift it up to God, he said, this bread symbolizes my body broken for you. Father, we thank you for this bread. And we thank you for the broken body that it symbolizes. We thank you that he died that we might live. We thank you that he was broken so we could be made whole. We thank you. In Jesus' name, take and eat. And then he took the cup and he lifted it and he said this is the blood of the new covenant every time you drink of this cup do it in remembrance of me father we thank you for the shed blood of Jesus Christ you we thank you Lord that that blood covers us and makes us the righteousness of God we thank you for the forgiveness. We thank you for the restoration. We thank you for the sacrifice, Father. As we take this cup, Lord, may we live in a manner worthy that you've called us to. Let us not take this unworthily. Let us not take this just as a routine. But let us take it, Lord, with full awareness of what it cost. In Jesus' name, amen. Take and drink. And would you just take your free hand and just lift it up to the Lord and just worship him and thank him and honor him if you want to feel his presence then you've got to talk to him you've got to thank him you've got to praise him you've got to worship him you've got to honor him you've got to exalt him you've got to love him so lord we thank you go ahead and don't let me pray for you talk to him yourself talk to him tell him thank you thank you lord Thank you, Lord. Thank him for yourself. Thank him for saving you. Thank him for dying for you. Thank him for his grace and his mercy. Thank you. Because if it had not been for the Lord who was on your side and my side, just think about where you, where you would be. You wouldn't be here. And so, Lord, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you. And all the earth will shout yours. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing, sing praise. Sing all the
everywhere, all across the room, would you just lift your hands before the presence of the Lord? Now lift your voice and worship to him. Honor him for his presence. Honor him that he is here. rise before him. Hallelujah. 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 Let the people of God give God a great praise offering in this house. Come on and bless the name of the Lord. God is good. Ain't he good? How many of you all love the Lord this morning? How many glad to be on the Lord's side today? Come on and bless the name of the Lord in this place. Surely our God, worthy of the glory. Let me just say welcome to each of you. So glad you're here with us in worship this morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. And no matter what you're dealing with, we're going to rejoice and be glad in it. Our soul shall make its boast in the Lord our God. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Hallelujah. Well, I know that it's COVID and all of that stuff, and I don't want you to do anything you don't feel comfortable with, but would you just greet your neighbor in a way that's comfortable to you? Would you just greet them in a way that's comfortable to you? this morning, if this is your first worship service here at New Life, would you just wave your hand at us? We'd love to see you. Wave at us, please, if this is your first time at New Life. Come on, New Life, let's give our first timers a really, really big, big welcome, a big, big welcome. So glad that you all are with us this morning. And I want to give a special, and I mean a special welcome to all of our online community family, our virtual online community. Come on, let's give them a real big hand to those that are joining us online from wherever you are. You can do better than that. Let's welcome all of our, first, all of our virtual online community. We're so grateful to God that God has called you to join us, whether you're online or in the room. Many of you are watching from different parts in the country and different parts around the world, and we are overjoyed and honored that you would uh, come to worship here at New Life. We know there are a myriad of choices that you have, but the fact that you are worshiping the Lord in this, um, in this house, it means the world to us. So those of you that are here and those of you that are tuning in, Thank you so much for your presence. One more time, give yourselves and all of our virtual community, give a real big hand, real big God bless you. I'm especially honored to have sharing with us this morning, uh, Commissioner Steve Bradshaw, and I want him to please stand up and so we'll get a chance to see him. Turn a little lights on in the house, would you? Just a little bit of lights in the house. We thank God for Commissioner Bradshaw. Thank you so much for being present with us today. Commissioner Bradshaw is candidate for the CEO seat in DeKalb County, and uh, we're just honored that you're here to worship the Lord with us today. Welcome. I want you to do me a favor. At the end of service, he's going to be around in uh, different parts. Would you just shake his hand and ask him every question you would ask, every question you would ask that would help you inform your vote. Amen? All right. Let's thank God for Commissioner Bradshaw. Thank you so much, sir, for being present today. If you missed the homegoing service for Sister Joyce Latson on yesterday, you really 
missed a special and amazing uh, service. Um, she lived an amazing life, and it was just a beautiful home going. And I'm so grateful to God that God allowed us to have Joyce in our life and in our church for the time that she was with us. Um, so much that she's done in her life that you never hear her talking about or bragging about or boasting over. And that's one of the signs of authentic greatness is that it never has to announce itself. Her life speaks for her. A little old song we used to sing, may the work I've done speak for me. And certainly the work that she's done is spoken for her and she is so terribly, terribly missed. Terribly missed. Please keep Brother Don in your prayers and her family in your prayers as uh, a life that, that critical. When it leaves your life, it leaves a hole there. It leaves a pain there. So would you remember them in your prayers, please? Amen. And also want to pray for the family of Sister Tammy Grimes. Uh, one of our members of our church who in later years in her life moved back to Valdosta, Georgia. Uh, Sister Aileen Payton, who was a part of our intercessory prayer ministry. And so many days she prayed for so many of us in so many ways and um, she went home to be with the Lord a couple of weeks ago and her home going was yesterday as well in Valdosta and uh, Tammy Grimes her daughter and of course Reginald Grimes her son-in-law and uh, the Grimes family and the Peyton family and their larger clan and I want you to please remember them in your prayers Aileen was a wonderful servant of God a prayer warrior and she had a heart that was three times the size of a normal heart she just loved people and she loved God and um, we are honored uh, to have known her and blessed to have been a part of her life and have her a part of ours and those two uh, women of God have gone on to be with the Lord uh, Joyce and Aileen Joyce Latson and Aileen Payton please remember their families in your prayers would you do that amen amen well, we've got a lot to announce, but I don't want to spend so much time on announcements, so I want you to remain at the end of service, and we will make our announcements at the end. Is that okay? All right. Is that all right? Are you still going to be here? Amen. Amen. So we'll make our announcements at the end. I do, though, want to mention by way of one announcement is that today is the first Sunday in Women's History Month. And let's um, honor the Lord for Women's History Month. Amen. 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 We have uh, an opportunity this month to celebrate the amazing contributions and the amazing life that so many women have trailblazed for us along the way. Every single aspect of significance in our country and even in our world has a woman's touch all over it and led and guided by women's insight and their wisdom. And so we want to celebrate this entire month. And next Sunday is a very special Sunday that we're going to be uh, focusing on Women's History Month and interviewing a legend in our city. This is Mrs. Uh, Zernona Clayton is going to be our special guest on next Sunday and uh, what an amazing lady she is 93 years young 93 years young and has the mind and memory and mental capacity of someone a third her age I mean I'm listening to her uh, talk and I'm just saying how do you remember all of those things in her life lived a full complete life a full life and we'll get a chance to meet her in person on next week as our special guest but there's a special video that we'd love to share in honor of women's history month and to introduce to us Ms. Zernona Clayton for next week please give attention to the video screen
have time for everything. Oh, everything. 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 The 12 o'clock news, you gotta come on at 12.20. That's right. He said, I'd do anything in the world for her. And he said, if Guys, I found her caught like in a burning building, wow. I'd go in to retrieve her. Wow. And then he said to my husband, of course, you'd do the same thing with her husband's A.O.E. to both of us. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, just the best the both of us doing it. If you gonna go in, then I'll stay out here. Right, right. <laughs> Young lady, from this day forward, I don't care who you have a date with. If you tell them you're gonna meet them on the corner of the street, and y'all gonna count blue cars that pass by as unimportant as that sounds, young lady, you show up. Yes, young lady, you show up. And that's our theme for next Sunday, is you show up. And women all across the country and around the world are showing up. We need some positive role models for our daughters and for our young girls. We are tired of the role models that Hollywood gives us because those role models are increasing the delinquency around among our children, especially our young girls. And we need to show them strength, beauty, dignity, class, intelligence, honor. We need to show them what a woman of God looks like. So I'm praying you'll be here next week as we spend this time celebrating women and celebrating the life of Zernona Clayton. Would you help me give God praise for all the ladies in our church and all the ladies who have had an impact in our world. Come on and help me do that. Amen. 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 All right, it's giving time. Time to honor the Lord with our gifts. We praise God for the privilege we have to give this morning. I want to encourage you as you're giving to be very faithful in giving twice today. We have not spoken about our dream campaign in quite some time, and as a result of that, many of us may have forgotten about that requirement to give. And I want to impress upon you again the need to give in our dream campaign. The Lord has blessed you, and God's seeking to bless this community. We are in well in our efforts to revitalize this immediate area. We believe God's called us to not only touch the inside of the church, but the outside of the church. And in this community, that is desperately needed. And I want it to be that our church is not just here to mark time and to blend in. That we're here to change the fabric and the nature and the heart of this community and to stand out. And so we're addressing four critical, significant areas. One is in the area of education. We believe God's called us to start an early childhood development center as well as a school. Um, looking at charter schools or private schools or Christian education. 
whatever the Lord allows us to do, that's where our heart is at. But we have that as a part of our pillar because these are the things that create poverty. When education is lacking or access to quality education is not equitable, then poverty follows. And so we want to have a solid quality educational experience and institution in this community. And secondly, it is access to health care. Equal solid access to quality health care. The Emory's and the Piedmont's and all the other large um, health care outfits of our city need to be in our our area need to be in our area if you are in need of a specialist if you are in need of a specialist of any kind you have to travel north to Dunwoody or in downtown or south to Stockbridge or McDonough because we're in a health care specialist desert where we are here are you understanding that and we believe that that should change, that we need to have quality health care in our community. And thirdly, it is workforce development, that God's not just calling us to tell people to get a job, but to provide opportunities and avenues and access so that they can get a job without having to go across town to work it, that they can do it in their own community, quality, successful, significant work right in our own back door. And that's a part of our dream campaign. I want to talk a little bit about that after uh, uh, in just a second, something I want to invite you to do. And then fourthly and lastly, those four areas that we're focusing on is housing. This is income-based housing, the ability to promote housing as well as home ownership in our community and God has opened so many doors for this to happen there's so many people that struggle with a church doing any of those four things and I don't understand why God has called us in the body of Christ to impact the practical lives of people where they live in a practical capacity what did Jesus do he touched them he did not just give a blessing to them and move on. He touched them. He changed their practical life. He ministered to them in a practical capacity. And that is the job of the church. We can preach all day, but if folks have no place to live, if they are sick and can't see a doctor, if they don't have a job, and if their kids are not quality, receiving a quality education, then our preaching becomes hypocritical because we're telling them about a Christ who only has the power to touch their spirit but not their body and their mind and their soul and our Savior touches every part of our life I ask so many of our friends you receive tithes and offerings every single week why 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 do you give it why do you support why do you give to ministry well I know because the Bible says to give and I get all of that I got it I got it and you should give but let's just be honest. Most of y'all ain't giving for that reason. Why do you give? Why do the church receive tithes and offerings? So the pastor can have a big car and a big house? You guys know that's not the case, at least not here. We give our tithes and our offerings so that the kingdom agenda can be fulfilled in the earth. That's why we give. That's why the church receives tithes and offerings, because God has an agenda. And it's so varied, so varied. It's not just the four we've mentioned. It's so varied. But at our church, we believe that God's agenda and his call and mandate to new life is to impact a hurting, impoverished poor community with the power of the gospel to practically change the lives of people and that's why we give and so I want to remind you of the need for committing to dream and giving to it many of us have committed to give 20 or 30 or 50 or even a hundred dollars more every week whatever you're able to give if it's one dollar then give one extra dollar a week if it's a hundred dollars give a hundred extra dollars a week as the Lord has blessed you so you be a blessing to somebody else amen 
And so on Sundays, we give twice. We give twice in our church. Once we give to our tithes and our offerings. This is so that the Spirit of God blesses our home and our family as we give. Your tithe has nothing to do with your eternal salvation. You know that. It has everything to do with your earthly satisfaction. And many of us are earthly experiencing financial woes because we have robbed God of the tithe. And so we give our tithe because it is our requirement to give it as the people of God. Not connected to our salvation, not about going to heaven, but everything about living on earth. Amen? And then we give secondly to our dream campaign. And this is to, to, to help the tithe ensure that the community is able to grow and to blossom. That God's called us to do the things and we're able to do those things he's called us to do. Now at the end of service today, we're going to offer a tour. And that's a lot of folks in here. So it's going to be very, very quickly. I pray that you will not go back to your cars. That you will give us 15 to 20 minutes at the end of service. We've been talking about that second one I mentioned, workforce development. We've been telling you that we believe God's called us to provide jobs in our community for people who live in this area that they don't have to get on MARTA to go across town to work in. We've been saying that. Well, we've turned our third floor, portions of the third floor of this building, we've turned it into a data center that has a partnership with an organization called People Shores, and you'll see them after in, at the end of service, or you'll see that space at the end of service, and they are hiring full a full data center jobs for different clients that allows for individuals in our community and in our area to both be trained and to receive jobs and to be paid for it immediately right as they start. So they're getting a living wage. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? Not just minimum wage, but a living wage. Listen, with benefits, with health care, with PTOs and vacation time, all the stuff that you and I get while they're being trained in a data center. They're being paid to be trained right here in our building as a part of our dream initiative. Amen. Tomorrow is the first day of the uh, center's operation. So today is the last day that we can tour it because it's going to be a data center and there'll be sensitive data that's there. So we can't tour it any other time. Today is our last day to tour it. It's right upstairs. It's after the elevator or the stairs right up to the third floor. I'm going to be uh, doing that tour at the benediction. I'm going to go straight out of that door and we're going to go right upstairs and I'm praying that you will follow. I'm praying that you will follow. Now there's a lot of folks in here in the building so we've all already got it designed where all you got to do is walk through and you're going to see more than the people shore space or the data center space you're also going to see our barbershop our beauty salon as well as our clothing store that many of you have not seen and you're not sure where your finances go where you have given to ensure that we could build that center and we can sponsor this kind of community development and employment development and I want you to see the fruits of your generosity. Would you do that at the end of service? All right, all right, all right. Well, we've spent too much time. It's giving time. Let's honor the Lord for the opportunity to give. Come on, let's bless God for the chance we have to give today. There are three ways you can give. You can give simply by going to our website. You can also give by text, and you can give by sending in your gifts. If you're watching online, you can mail them to the address on the bottom of your screen. If you're in the room, you have a fourth way you can give, and that is through the envelopes in the seat back covers just in front of you. So please take a moment to do that. Take a moment to prepare your tithes, your offerings, and your dream campaign commitments, and to give them today. Let's take a moment to prepare our gifts. Let's ask the Lord to bless our time in giving. Father, thank you for the gifts 
that we are enabled to give. Thank you, God, that you have given us the ability to sow these seeds. Now I pray that you'd receive them and that you would allow for our gifts to do far more than we ever imagined that they could do. May they literally change this area and this community in Jesus' name. Amen and amen again. Well, as a family, both in the room and online, would you take out your smartphones or your devices and let's prepare ourselves to give? There are three ways you can do that and they're on the screen. Amen. Let's thank God once more time for the privilege and the honor we have to give. Thank you so much for your generosity and for your kindness. Well, we are in the middle of our series um, on freedom, freedom from anxiety. And we're going to be talking about stress and anxiety today and how you can find freedom from it. We're going to learn from the master teacher, and that's Jesus, and his ministry to us through the word is our heart. I pray that your heart is open to receive. There's a special song we're going to sing and it just speaks of the power of the Lord Jesus as it relates to the stresses and anxieties of our life. Open your heart. Receive the music and the worship of God and the word of God. Bless you, brother. I'm all alone. It's your hand I find too. In each hour of unrest, when it seems I've nothing left, you speak. I'm arriving and 
when I'm leaving, you will have me in your keeping. Even from my mother's womb, never hidden from your view. When I fade away in death, you will catch my final breath, and you will take me to my rest. that I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known for you are always always Sing that over yourself for you. Sing it to him. Are always, always with me for you. You are, you're all.
from my mother's womb Never hidden from your view I was always known to you So when I fade away to catch my final breath and you will take me to a rest for you are sing always always with So, Father, you are always with us. That promise is the very crux and core of our confidence. In no season of our life are we ever alone. You're with us on the worst days of our life. When tragedy strikes, when trouble looms ahead, when the dark clouds follow us, when sorrow beams down our back, you are always with us. You're with us in bereavement. You're with us in illness. You're with us in pain. You are with us in struggle. Our confidence is that you're always walking, talking with us. Be with us as your word is preached. Let the clarity of your gospel, let the purity of your truth permeate our very souls. Prick our conscience with the power of your word. May it be authentic. May it be genuine. So all of the broken spaces in my life, don't allow them to hinder what you want to do. Use this moment for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a praise. Thank God for that beautiful song. You are always with us, always with us. Well, this is our third installment in our series that we've been teaching titled Freedom, Freedom from the Power of Anxiety. And if I could title this message, it would simply be Why Worry? Why Worry? I want to deal with and talk about the futility of worry, the uselessness of it. It's like jumping on a treadmill and expending an enormous amount of energy, but going nowhere. It produces no results. It has absolutely no power at all. It is probably the greatest delusionary diversion 
that Satan has ever deposited into the human psyche. It is the thought that if you worry hard enough, long enough, if you worry significantly enough, if you think all the right thoughts, if you can calculate every specific move that is necessary, then somehow this problem will go away. And the reality is that the problem that you are worrying about is no way contingent upon your worry. It exists independent of what you think and how hard you ruminate over the issues. You can roll them around in your head over and over and over again endlessly and mindlessly and it will still exist. Because problems don't check in with our thoughts before they come into our life. They come into our life whether you are prepared, ready, or inviting it or not. And so rather than worrying about the issue, let's find out how we can deal with the issue and learn Jesus' cure for worry. Now I need to tell you that the scene is very clear. Jesus spent his time on the earth teaching and preaching about a kingdom that was not yet come. It was a kingdom at hand, a kingdom at the doors, a kingdom close, but had not yet come into full fruition and into full reality in the life of Christ. His life, the three years he was on earth, and many felt that his kingdom would be physical. His kingdom would be a natural kingdom like all the other kingdoms of the world. He would set up a national strength, and he would have a national military and a national expression to his kingdom, and his kingdom was of not of this world at all. His kingdom was a spiritual kingdom. And as he was laying out the constitution for his kingdom, he spends time preaching what we know as the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is those three chapters, chapter 5, 6, and 7 of the Gospel of Matthew. And it is also paralleled in many of ways in the uh, Gospel of Luke as well. Now, commentators have argued about when Jesus preached this sermon. Some have said that it's possible that he preached the sermon all at one time, that he preached three full chapters of multiple topics and did it all in one particular sitting. And others have said that Jesus preached these messages in bite-sized chunks over the life of his three-year ministry. And as he preached these messages, Matthew and Luke had, would record his messages and compiled them just for the sake of clarity and ease in this one section in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. Now, I don't know which is true or which is not, and I don't think that it's critical or it matters, except how, when he preached it and how long he preached it isn't really the issue. The issue is who he was preaching to. The issue that he was preaching to people who were broken, people who were hurting, people who were dealing with the stress of a very oppressive Roman regime. The Roman Empire, led by uh, Caesar, led in its local context by Pilate and other local governors throughout all of the provinces of Judah and Israel. This, this, this nation would oppress the people of Israel greatly economically. It oppressed them socially. It oppressed them. Their socioeconomic status was always beneath and behind uh, the Roman Empire. Politically, it oppressed them militarily. It oppressed them and it was extremely violent whenever they would speak up and out against the Roman Empire. These were people who were dealing with an enormous amount of stress. And Jesus spent his time teaching them how to deal with their reality. He talked about what it meant to be blessed and gave them the principles of a kingdom man and a kingdom woman who is blessed. He said that they're blessed when you're a peacemaker. You're blessed when you're meek. You're blessed whenever you mourn over your sin. You're blessed whenever you're poor in spirit. He gave the characteristics of what it means to be blessed. And then he spoke about the identity of the people and he said in my kingdom in my kingdom it operates the opposite of the world's kingdom those who are the last are first those at the bottom are at the top the servants are the greatest he says you are a light 
that is set on a hill. He said, you are the salt of the earth, and you are the people who keep the earth within its flavor, its moral flavor. You keep the earth salted, if you will. And then he spoke about the contrast of the people in his kingdom to the people in the world's kingdom, the immediate Jewish kingdom. He spoke about the Phariseeism and how Phariseeism seeks to promote itself and to shine itself, praying in the open spaces, giving its alms so that men could see and fasting in a way that it, it would speak about its fast and announce its fast to others. And Jesus said, when you do it, you do it in secret. You do it privately. He says your private devotion is far more important than your public decorations. And then he spent some time dealing specifically and deeply with the issue of material possessions. He talks about material possessions in such a significant way, even so much that he calls material possessions mammon. And he says it has the power to be a god. Mammon comes from this, um, this mythological Babylonian idea of a god of materialism. And Jesus says that you can't serve both God and materialism. You can't serve both God and mammon. And then he drills down from his discussion about materialism. He drills down to the crux of the matter. And he says you can't have two masters. You can't have two masters. You'll either love one or hate the other. You'll cling to one and you'll despise the other. You can't have two lords over your life. And from that discussion about two masters, about mammon, about materialism, from his larger discussion about hypocrisy and public displays, about image that isn't true to who you truly and authentically are, from this whole idea of what it means to be light and salt in the earth, how we are to take the low road and not the high road, how humility is the thing that inherits the earth. After turning the entire moral structure of human ideology upside down, he then says to us, do not worry. <laughs> it's almost as if he was saying that the reason why we worry is because we have gotten wrong all the other things he just got finished expressing. We try to be in charge and not meek. We try to get revenge and not seek peace. We try to hide our sins and not mourn over them. We try to be prideful and big. We try to make sure that our name is in lights and not meek and humble. We try to fake the funk and act like we're really rich in spirit and spiritually there and we are so spiritually sound and great and we're not humbled and broken and poor in spirit. We're persecuted and we persecute back. We seek revenge. We revile those who revile us. We hurt those who hurt us. We get back at those who injure us. We keep records of wrongs. We don't turn the other cheek. We don't give a person an opportunity to even hit one cheek. Take off our coat and our cloak and give it to someone who wins the court case. We appeal the court case and sue them back. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. It is get in where you fit in. It is every man for himself. And that is the world that Jesus came to turn upside down. It is inconsistent with his kingdom principles. And he says, the constitution of my kingdom, the constitution of my kingdom is humble first. The constitution, the declaration that declares my kingdom's charter is that you turn the other cheek. My kingdom says that you are humbled before you are prideful. My kingdom says you're broken and that's why you have claim to the kingdom of God. 
My kingdom says that things don't control you and materials don't master you. My kingdom says that when you lose, you win. My kingdom says being broken is being honest. And because we don't hear him when he speaks about his kingdom, for that reason he said, why do you worry? I want to read it for us. Here are the Lord Jesus' words. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 25, he says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry. The King James says, take no thought. He says, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. For they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one measure of length to his stature? Or as another version says, one hour to his lifespan. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? And then he puts his finger on the very heart of the issue. And he says, oh, you of little faith. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after all these things do the people in the other kingdom worry about. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. But you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these other things will be added unto you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is the trouble thereof. I want to take time to unpack what Jesus says and to understand it in our individual context. First thing we said last week quickly is that anxiety or worry, it is the mental battle that we fight. It is the mental battle that we fight between a reality I can't control and a future I can't predict. It is the battle that we fight between a reality that I have no control over and a future that I cannot predict. I have no idea what will happen in the future. And whenever you have anxiety and worry in your life, it creates this thing called stress. And what Jesus was teaching about, that we'll get to in a, just a moment, but let me just set this up. It's stress is the crux of what he was teaching about. And here he's saying, listen carefully, listen carefully. He is saying, when you choose to live your life outside of the principles of the kingdom of God, you inevitably invite the deadly stress into your life, trying to live in a way that God has not designed for you to live. Stress is an interesting word. It did not enter into the psychology books until the turn of the 20th century. Before 1916, stress was not considered a psychological phenomenon. 
It was purely an engineering and physics phenomenon. That stress is borrowed from its physics world into the psychology world because of the connection it has to physics as well as engineering and the economy of materials. And stress is defined this way very clearly in engineering context. It simply means whenever there is an outside force that presses upon any particular object and the outside force is stronger than the internal strength of the object, then the object will bend and break and yield to the outside force because it does not have the internal strength to withstand it. That is all stress is. Stress is when what's on the outside of you is stronger than what's on the inside of you. Stress is when you are weaker than your circumstances. When you are weaker than your experiences, when you are weaker than the challenges, tragedies, the, the, the issues we face on a regular basis, when you are weaker than the pains around you, stress is the result. And you can't build a house with a beam that cannot withstand stress. You can't build a house with wood that can't take stress. And so before the modern context of building, the modern context of using steel and iron for our structures, when wood was the only way in which structures were done, they would stress the wood. The word stress was both a construction word and an engineering physics word before it ever became a psychology word. And you stress wood very simply. And the way you would stress the wood is you take the plank that you're looking to build your house with and you lay it between two particular bars and raise it up. And then you simply would take a stress beam. A stress beam is a big, massive trunk of a tree that you never built with it. You always used it as your gauge, as your tester. And you take the stress beam and you would lift the stress beam up through some other kinds of mechanisms and get the stress beam on top of the, the wood beam you want to build your house with. And you would let the pressure of the stress beam fall on the wood beam to see if the wood can handle the stress. And the stress beam, you would slowly lift it down and let its weight fall upon it little by little by little, and you would watch how the wood beam bends under the stress. And as the wood beam would bend under the stress, when the full weight of that beam was on the wood, if it bent too far, that beam was not appropriate to build your house. You need a stress beam, heavy, weighty, difficult, hard, to lay it on top of the life beam and see when it breaks. Because if you break under the stress, then you can't build your life. Are you understanding what I'm saying to you? They would never know how strong the wood beam is until the stress beam was laid on top of it. The danger would be if you built your house without testing the wood. Then when you built your house and you didn't test the wood, when rain or snow would fall upon the home or the weight of the house itself would cause the beams to crumble and break and then the house was considered unstable because the beams had not been tested. How do you not know 
that what you are dealing with and going through and the challenges you're faced with is nothing more than God putting the stress beam on your life to see how much you are able to bear. Is anybody hearing this? And God knows that he wants to build a life around you. He wants family and finances and future in your life, but you cannot handle the blessings of God if you are not able to withstand the stress. So the stress was not a negative word. Stress was a positive word. Now, what they would do is whenever they had a beam that bent too far under the stress, they would relieve the stress. They would put a double beam on it and nail those two beams together and put it back on it again. And then whenever it would bend some more, they would relieve the stress and put a third beam on it and nail those three beams together and put the stress beam back on it again until the beams were able to hold up the stress. The reason why many of us are struggling under the weight is because we have not had another beam nailed to us. There is another beam you need to be connected to. By yourself, you cannot handle it. But when you get the beam of the Holy Ghost, when the beam of the Father and the beam of the Son, when a Trinitarian beam is laid on top of you, it can handle what you cannot handle. It fortifies my weakness and strengthens me in the area that I'm falling apart. When I bend, that's my need to pray. My indication that I need to get nailed to the Father is when the stress is too heavy for me to handle. So Jesus says, don't worry. We told you last week that we worry as a comfort. Many of us worry because it's just a comfort for us to do that. We worry because we want to feel in control. We worry because we think worrying is being careful. And I've got much more to say about those, but I won't deal with it. I won't do it. Worry as a comfort, worry to be in control, worry to be careful or to feel that you're being careful all comes from fear. Anxiety is nothing more but a kind of fear. It is a type of fear. That's what anxiety is. And the Bible is very clear in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7 that God has not given you the spirit of fear. If you're afraid of something, I don't care how dangerous it might look, God has not given you the spirit of fear. Now let me be very clear, fear can be a good thing. Fear keeps me safe. Fear keeps me from walking over the edge. Fear stops me from being foolish. So fear can be a good thing. But there is a fear that becomes a spirit. And when fear is a spirit, that means it controls my behavior, it controls my thought life, it controls my actions, and that is the spirit of fear. Fear is meant to be the red light on the dash. It is not meant to be the power engine that drives the car. It is only the indicator that something is wrong. It is not to be the engine that powers the life. Many of us use fear the wrong way. We have turned the keys of our life over to fear, and we allowed fear to enslave us and fear to bondage us and that is not God's will you make fear a spirit in your life when you do not have the counteracting force of faith to overcome your fears faith overcomes fear faith overcomes fear it is the opposite of fear. It is the antidote to fear. It is the answer to fear. It's trusting in something stronger, bigger, greater than yourself. And so we worry as a comfort. We worry because it makes us feel good. We worry because we become addicted to it. We worry because we want to be in control. We want to master everything around us. 
And if you control everything on the outside, you have no control on the inside. We worry because we think it's being careful. And anytime you let those three things master your life, you give way to fear. All right, so what does fear do? Fear is four deadly, four deadly things that bring about fear. These are the four deadly causes of our worry. Number one is the fear of loss. Two is the fear of lack. Three is the fear of the load and the fear of being less than. And here's what we stopped on last week together. The first thing is the fear of loss. The fear of loss. Jesus talks about this particular fear in what he says in Matthew chapter 6, verse number 19. He deals with this whole idea of loss. In Matthew 6 and verse 19, Jesus says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. He says, don't make your life such, listen carefully, don't make your life the kind of life where moth and rust and thieves can cause loss. You experience loss when you put your treasures on the earth. You experience loss whenever you make the earth the ground for your treasures. When the most precious things in your life are kept in the treasure box of the earth. When there is no eternal value to the things you treasure. When all of your treasures are earthly related and they're earthly dependent. He says you position yourself for loss. Because anything that you put on the earth, he says time and circumstance will cause it to rust away. It will make it decay and destroy itself. Time and circumstance. Many people have their money as their treasure. They have friends as their treasure. Their family is their treasure. Their spouse is their treasure. They have treasure in their clothes, treasure in their jobs, their positions, that's their treasure. Their image is their treasure. What they, who they are to the world around them, that's their treasure. And they treasure all of these earthly things and they place everything they have, money, in position, image, family, spouse, children, family, all that we have, we place it in the earth. And we expect the earth for, to keep it safe. What do I mean by placing it on the earth? What does Jesus mean when he say, put it in the earth? What he means is that you attach to the things you treasure a temporary significance, but you have thought in your mind it has eternal value. You limit everything you have to the safekeeping of the world around you. So you depend on your job to take care of you. You depend on your image to make you feel significant. You depend on other people to give you a sense of value. You actually think your degrees is going to protect you against future poverty or future loss. You make the things of this world, you ascribe to them eternal value. You have deluded yourself into thinking that the earth is heaven. And heaven is the earth. And you have given eternal, you've given eternal significance to something that has no eternal value at all. He says, when you do this, when you put the wrong weight on the wrong thing, the beam is going to break. Because your life, your image, your position, your job, your money, your family, your friends, your spouse, your children were never meant to hold up that kind of weight. Was never meant to do it. There are people that fall apart, lose their life, lose their will to live because someone in their life died and they lose all will to live because someone died there are people that lose their will for life their zest for life 
because a job ended or a pink slip was given or they were laid off. In the 1920s and the early 30s, there were people that were literally jumping out of buildings, putting revolvers in their mouth and blowing their brains out because they lost their savings and their life earnings on the stock market. And because they lost all they had, they could not find any will left to live. It's when you put your treasure on the earth. Are you understanding what I'm saying? How many people have put their significance and made their full life value the thing they do nine to five? They've defined themselves by their job. Or they define themselves by their career. And it has destroyed all sense of peace and happiness and joy. They have no time for anything else because that consumes everything about them. They've lost themselves in the title that's on their business card. Because you put your treasure in the earth. Are you understanding what I'm saying to you? How many boyfriends and girlfriends have gotten eye candy on their side and walked down the aisle because that person made them feel like they were somebody only to discover that another human being can never give you definition to who you are called to be. And their identity is swallowed up in somebody else. And they put their treasure in the earth. And whenever you attach eternal significance to something that is temporary and fleeting, you put a heavy beam on a board that was never designed to carry it. And so Jesus says, whatever you do, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where time and circumstance will destroy it and where thieves break in and steal. If time doesn't get it and if circumstance doesn't get it, I guarantee you the enemy will get it. The thieves are the demons of this world. Now don't look at me like you don't know what that is. There are demons everywhere, everywhere around us. They are there. And the demons are not the ugly gremlins of the 1980s. Some of y'all are too young to remember that. But the demons are those Im immaterial, those non-physical aspects of our own psyche. Like guilt and greed and lust and envy and jealousy and rage and anger and intemperance and lack of self-control and pride. All that I've just named are thieves and demons and robbers. And when you put your treasure on the earth, I promise you greed will get the best of it and pride will get the best of it and anger will get the best of it and rage will get the best best of it and jealousy will get the best of it and envy will get the best of it it'll rob us of our ability to handle the load because we are cowering under all the thieves that are trying to steal what we hold dear to ourselves and here's what Jesus is saying he is saying when you put that much weight on something that flimsy and that fleeting you can expect it to break he says don't lay up for yourselves treasures on the earth where time and circumstance destroy it and where thieves demons break in and steal he says but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal for where your treasure is, there your heart is also. I don't have a lot of time here except to say he did not say something was wrong with treasures. There's nothing wrong with treasures. All those things I just mentioned, your job, your car, your house, nothing wrong with those things. Your family, your loved ones, your spouse, your children, you know there's nothing wrong with those things. Your position, your image, ain't nothing wrong with any of that. Your reputation, there's nothing wrong with treasures. Just put them in the right spot. Ain't nothing wrong with treasures. 
but make sure they are in the hands of heaven. When you put your treasures in the hands of God, then you don't ever have to worry about the treasure being taken from you. Is anybody hearing what I'm saying to you? When God is in charge, can I get a witness here? When God is in charge of the treasures of our life, nothing can cause it to rust or destroy. No time, no circumstance can cause it to decay. And no demons can come in and steal. Are you hearing me? Someone, you say, what God has for you is for you. That's very true. What God has destined for you is yours. You don't have to force it. It's yours. And whenever God gives it to you, you don't have to watch over it like a hawk. It's yours. You don't have to fret. You don't have to be afraid. You ain't got to be scared. You ain't got to be timid. It's yours. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? God has blessed you with so many gifts and graces and God has given you so much but you're so afraid that you're going to lose this and lose that and it's going to walk out and it'll never be here. You're so afraid that someone is going to think something different about how you want them to think about you that you have allowed for life to rob you of the zest of the blessings God has given to you. And he says if you put your treasure in the hands of your God you don't have to fret yourself. Is anybody hearing what I'm saying to you? And so the fear of loss is the first huge fear. But the second fear is the fear of lack. The fear of lack. Not just the fear of loss because that your treasure and you'll lose it to put it in the wrong spot. He says, but then there is a fear of lack. And it says in verse 24, and many of us think about Jesus' message on the fear of lack and we started in verse 25 and I want to tell you that you're starting it too early verse 25 begins with the one word therefore and anytime you see a therefore in the text you always have to read up above the therefore to find out what the therefore is there for. Yeah. We call that context. And if you read a text out of context, then you'll never derive at a proper hermeneutic for its understanding. Your hermeneutics have got to be built upon the context surrounding any text. And the way the text gives you a clue that there is a context above me, he puts the word therefore or wherefore in the text to force you to connect one verse with the verses in front of a therefore so you'll get the full context of the text and not develop a pretext that will give you, is anybody hearing what I'm saying to you? God is trying to get you to look up before you digest verse 25 don't read verse 25 unless you can digest it in the context of verse 24 verse 24 says no man can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will loyal to the one, be loyal to the one, and despise the other. You can't serve God and materials, God and mammon, God and riches, God and stuff Therefore, do not worry about what you shall eat or drink or put on. You're worried about what you shall eat or drink or put on because you have, go back up for me please, because you have two masters. I don't know why it always takes this long for the ghost to show up. You have two masters. two masters in charge of your life and when you have divided loyalty you will always be stressed out stress enters the life because you can't figure out if you want to love one or hate the other so you try to dangle between two opinions you try to straddle the fence between two sides. You got God in your left hand 
and you got your job in your right hand and you think both of them are equal and whenever the job begins to fail you call on God but when the job is doing well you forget about God and call on the job and God is saying I don't play second fiddle in nobody's orchestra I am the conductor I am the navigator of the ship I am the maker and builder of the house I will have no other gods not just before me I will have no gods beside me I'm God and I'm God all by myself can I get a witness here is not waiting on your job so he can be God. He ain't waiting on your bills to clear up so he can be God. He ain't waiting on your blessings to come in so he can be God. Anybody in the building know it? That God is God. Whether you got money or not, God is God. Whether you got food to eat or not, God is God. If you got clothes on your back, or not God is God no matter what the problem that's stressing you out is you got two masters and you're trying to make both of your masters happy you're trying to serve both masters and on Monday through Friday you serve the job master and then you rush home and you serve the husband master. And then you get ready for bed and you serve the kids master. And then you go to church on Sunday and you serve the church master. And then you gotta oversee your, your, your social club and you serve the social club master. And then you know you're a big shot in your fraternity. So you serve the frat master. And then you gotta go eat. So you serve the belly master. You like to go eat good. You do cheesecake factory. So you serve the finer things master. Then you gotta go shopping. So you serve the clothes master, the Neiman Marcus master, the richest master, the Macy's master. And God is saying, when are you gonna put all of those other masters behind me? If you just serve one master, I'll take care of everything else. Somebody say yes. Oh, 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 one master, one master, one master, one master. He says, you cannot, you will stress yourself out trying to make everybody happy. So the illustration that I was going to give that I can't give is I was going to see if I could find somebody who could juggle. And we actually have one, of, can you juggle Julius? We actually have a, Julius can juggle. One of our security officers, Brother McNair, he can juggle. And I was gonna call and see if he could come and I was gonna give him how many balls can you juggle without dropping any? And let's say he said three then I was gonna have him bring three balls and have him juggle them. Then I was gonna have 17 other balls and I was gonna throw a ball at him and see how he handled that. <laughs> then I was gonna throw another ball at him and see how he handled that. And then I was gonna throw another ball at him and see how he handles that. And at some point, The balls were going to drop. Is anybody hearing me? And then I was going to find somebody who could juggle 10 balls with ease and not tell McNair that I had somebody who can juggle better than him. And I was going to have McNair stressed out. And I was going to have the person who can handle the stress 
Kel McNair just tossed me the balls. But I got to keep the job. But I got to keep her happy. But I got to take care of the bills. But I got to make sure the kids taken care of. But I got to make sure my name is good. And I was going to have McNair, 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 just throw him the ball. But you don't understand, Pastor, that if I don't juggle these balls, ain't nobody going to do it but me, McNair, McNair. He's standing right here. Give up control and throw him the ball. And he was going to throw him one ball. And he would just say, man, this is easy. Give me another one. Two balls. Give me another one. Three balls. Give me another one. Four balls. Give me another one. Because God can juggle a whole lot more than you can handle. The moment you reach your extremity, that's when God just gets started. God is just getting started. When you're stressed to the max, that's when God says, I died for this. Cast all your cares upon me because I care for you. Is there anybody in the building that's glad to know that God can handle what I'm drowning under? God can handle. He says, the problem you have is you have two masters. And as long as you have two masters, you're never going to get your stress under control. But if you would give him the balls, he said, you'll learn how not, oh God, how not to worry. Because it ain't under my control anyhow. I want to be at a season of my life where I just walk around and watch God do the work. I want to be at a season of my life whenever God says, Marlon, I got this. Here, handle that one. I got this. And I want to take what I can handle and throw my one little ball up in the air. And while you laughing at me, I ain't stressed out. While you talking about he ain't doing nothing. I ain't stressed out. Why are you talking about it? I wonder how in the world he going to make it. I ain't stressed out. And then folk will come back and see what God has done and can't figure out how you did so much with just one ball. They don't understand. All you see is one ball. But I got 16 other balls in the hands of my God. And God is doing exceedingly. Hey, abundantly. Above all that I could ask or think, is there anybody in the room this morning that's glad God's got it, that's glad God's in charge, that's glad God knows how to work on my behalf? Is there anybody, is there anybody in the room that's glad about it if I give it to him? Before we look at verse 25, we got to look at verse 24 because the power in verse 25 is wrapped up in verse 24. When you lay down one of your masters and cling only to him, he says you won't worry about what you shall eat and what you shall drink. And what you shall wear. Man, I got to stop. Somebody give God praise. We'll look at 25 next week. Somebody give God the glory. Somebody give God the glory. Look at your neighbor and say, God. Yes. <laughs>
those hands in the presence of the Lord. Lift those hands. The enemy has been telling you that you're drowning. The enemy has been telling you that you can't handle it. The enemy has been telling you that you're about to break. But God is speaking to you. And he is saying, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be cast into the sea, God will never leave you. God is telling you and I am with you through the fire and the flood. And the fire shall not burn you. And the water shall not overwhelm you. Because God will never leave you. God is telling you that yea, though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You have no need to fear, for he is with you. He is your rod and your staff. You can fear no evil. Come on and say it, I will fear no evil. Come on and say it, I will fear no evil. Say it again, I will fear no evil. I know it looks bleak, but I will fear no evil. I know you're down to your last ten dollar bill. I will fear no evil. I know the savings has dried up but I will fear no evil. I know the plot is against you, but I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. For thou art with me. Right here, right now. Get out of your seat. If you know that you need to be at this altar, if evil has been gripping your mind, and causing you to marinol, it's been splitting your mind, stressing you out, causing you to be afraid, can't sleep at night, can't think straight during the day, your cognition is off, your recall is off, you're off your game. You're not as sharp as you used to be. You've been fearing evil. The enemy's been whispering in your ears, telling you every little thing that can go wrong. And you've been believing the lies. You drank the Kool-Aid. You've been believing what the devil has said. I want to tell you, the devil is a liar. It ain't going to break. It ain't going to go belly up. It ain't going to be destroyed. He who has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. The Lord is your rock and your refuge. In him will you trust. Get out of your seat. Make it down here to this altar. Let's let go of one of those masters. 
Let's let go of one of those masters. Your money has been mastering you. Your career has been mastering you. Your position has been mastering you. No more. No more. That stops now. That stops now. You are not under the control of anything except God. Every head bowed, every hand raised. Now we're going to worship God with everything we have in us. chains break your praise is how they break yeah God yes 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 I'm sensing that the Lord doesn't want me to pray for you. But the Lord actually wants you to pray for you. The priesthood of every believer teaches us that you are a priest. You have access to God on your own behalf. And we've been dependent on somebody else to take us there. And God is saying, I want you to come boldly before the throne. Nobody knows your dilemma like you know it. Nobody knows your fears like you know it. So every voice lifted in this room at this altar, and I want you praying that God would send his presence and his power in your life. I want you praying that God would rebuke the devourer for your sake pray that God would do what only he can do that he would hold back the advances of the enemy that he would not let worry control your life that you would not be enslaved to anxiety that anxiety would not be your master open your mouth and pray 
Open your mouth and call him. Open your mouth and declare it. Declare that he's yours. Declare that you are his. You're his child. You belong in his family. Open your mouth, saints. Open your mouth and call him by his name. Say it so the devil can hear you praying. He's been trying to rob you of this access. He's been trying to rob you of this opportunity to talk to your father. Open your mouth and declare it. Not until I hear that sound, we will not move any further. You didn't come to this altar to be bound. You came to this altar to be released. Open your mouth and declare that God is on the throne. Yes, yes, yes. This is what the enemy is afraid of. This is what he's scared of. This is what it frightens him. He has no power when you start doing this. He loses his authority when you start doing this. He loses his grip over your life when you start calling the name of Jesus. You're watching online, right in your room. The power of God is right there. Open your mouth right at your table, right at your couch, right in front of that screen, and begin to call on the name of Jesus. Call on the name of Jesus. If you're in this room, in the back or the front, call on the name of Jesus. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, God. Yes, God. Now let's break every chain. See, I hear the chains fall. Yes, God. Can we lift it all over the room? Say, I hear the chains. I hear the chains. you're not a Christian, you're not born again and you want to be, you're not saved and you know you need to be, right where you are, I want you to lift your hands right where you are. If you're saying, I need to be born again, lift them now. Lift them right now. I see you. I see you. I see you. I see you, sir. Praise God. I need to be born again. I'm tired. I'm tired of living the way I've been living. I see you. I see you. I need to be born again. I want to be saved. I see you. Somebody give God the glory here. 
If you know that God's called you to join this church and join this ministry, if you're fully aware of that, this is home. This is home. Lift your hands right now, wherever you are, at the altar or in the room. Lift your hands. If God is saying, this is home, you know it. You know it. I see you. I see you. I see you. This is home. All right. If you lifted your hands, if you raised your hands for either one of those needs, I want you to make your way to the front. Just tell the person in front of you, excuse me, I got to get where I need to be. I got to get right with God. I got to get in the house I'm supposed to be in. I got to get born again. Make your way right down the front. Come on, saints of God. Praise God as they're coming. Praise God as they're coming. Praise God as they're coming. Come meet me right over here, right over here on this side. Meet me right over here, right over here on this side. Somebody give God the glory. Meet me right over here on this side. I want to be born again. God's called me to join this church. Meet me right over here, right over here. that's in your chat space. It's a Zoom room and there are live ministers and live leaders waiting to minister to you. If you need to be saved and born again, if God's calling you to join this church, just click that link and put it in your URL in your browser and it'll take you to a Zoom room. Leave your camera off. Leave your heart on. The Lord is speaking to you. Don't turn off this broadcast and this stream the way you are right now. You can be changed. Let's deal with those two masters, can we? Click that link. There's a live leader waiting to pray for you and minister to you right now. Let's give God praise. God bless you. Let's give God praise. All right. I, we were supposed to be done long before now. Was I even talking to anybody a few minutes ago? Well, in the room I was. How many of you all heard what God had to say? All right. We're getting ready to go on our tour. We're going to tour, and I want you to see where your investment is going. Many of you have been giving the dream, and I appreciate the confidence you have in our leadership, our elders, and myself, I appreciate that, but you really need to see where your gifts and where your resources are going because it encourages you as you're being faithful to God, you know your church is being faithful to its call. And so we're going to go, don't go to your rooms, don't go to your cars, you don't have to do that just yet. For okay, those of you okay. that want to do this tour, meet me right outside this side door. Commissioner uh, Bradshaw is here. And this is what I'm going to do. Commissioner Bradshaw is going to be standing right down here. Those of you that are interested in asking him questions about the CEO position and what his platform is, I encourage you all to do that with him. And then those of you that are going on the tour to follow us on the tour. Is that okay? All right. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious unto you. The Lord grant you his peace in your rising and your setting, today and forever, in Jesus' name, amen. I love you so much. Come meet me on the third floor. Yes.
Thank you so much, Antonio. <laughs> this is it? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. She's fine. You're doing fine. Come on. Yes. Come on in. Yes, ma'am. You're okay. I don't think we can take too much more, though. We'll stop it right here. Okay. You sure? Okay. Okay. All right. Is everybody able to hear me? Okay. Hey, guys, those of you that are online, thank you so much for being online. So I'm taking you now to our space that we have for workforce development. When we pass this door, this is the door. I'm talking about. This is the door that houses all of the homeless and those who come for support. They are in this area here. You show this area. They're in this area here and they wait until they're able to have uh, their number called and it allows them to go back for dignity services. They'll come through this door and we're talking about folks that are homeless, indigent, people that are, uh, come on in, come on in, come on in, people that are homeless and indigent, um, those who are at risk of being homeless, those who are unemployed between jobs and the rest, please come on in. This is the holding area for them and it'll hold about a hundred and some uh, folks and they are staying here until they go through this door which is opening up to new services how y'all doing all right there are chairs down this aisle here that um, we don't have down right now the first stop is the uh, praise salon and we have our trusted praise salon workers come on in Kenny I want you to get show the folks online all of this this is where we do Ministry to Homeless Women in the Praise Salon. Please come on in as best you can. Squeeze in. I know it's kind of tough. And um, this, is, this is a place that many of you would be going to get your hair done. And this is a ministry to those who are uh, homeless ladies or those who have a job coming up, a job interview, and uh, need to have their hair done and don't have the money to do it. This is 100% free. We charge nothing for the services, not even tips. Um, but we come in, and it's just a place where the Spirit of God dwells. All of our clinicians are some are volunteers, some are professionals. Uh, they do a tremendous job. Tammy, anything you want to say? I want to correct him. All of us are kitchen beauticians, um, <laughs> we like to say. And what we do is we want the ladies to understand, one, that they're beautiful when they come in the door, right? And so we just add to that. And what we want to add is a way for them to allow us to open the door to their hearts so that when they come on Saturday, they're ushered in on Sunday. And so we love on them with the love of Jesus. And by doing that, they allow us to touch their hair and touch their heart, and we send them back out in the world with that. Amen, amen. So I'm going to go out this door, but you guys are welcome to come and walk all around and then meet me in the next room, okay? So you're welcome, those who want to, let others come. So go ahead and walk all around if you choose to. If others, you'll need to go in. You may not get the benefit of the, uh, of, of the commentary, but please go in this room and then come out and meet us on the other side. All right. And the next room is our barber shop. So come on inside. Come on inside. Encourage them to come inside, sirs. Come on inside. Pack it out. Pack it out as close as you can get. As close as you can get. Come on inside. As close as you can get. This is where homeless men come and they are receiving services here. Come on in, please just make your way in so others can enter behind you. So others can enter behind you. We'll try and get as many folks as we can in. And Brother Scott, you have about uh, 30 seconds. What happens in this room? Ministry happens in this room. Come on in, come on in, come on in, so folks can get behind you and come 
A lot of the ministry that we do is debate to lead them to Jesus. And a lot of people need haircuts and just regular practical services. And it starts in this room. So when they come in this room to get their hair cut, they get so much more than that because each of the people that cut hair are actually ministering to them. They're listening to them. They begin a relationship that gets fed and gets watered and grows at New Life through Pastor Harris. Praise God. This is beautiful, is it not? All right. So... If you want to walk around, you can. We're going to give... Yeah, you can ask questions. You're fine. All right, we're going to leave so others can go inside. This is our barber shop, and it'll give you a chance to go inside the barber shop. You guys, if, you, if, if I could get one of you guys to help make sure that the rooms get cleaned out, I'm fine. I'm good. I'm good. Yes, sir. I'm good. I'm good. Stay back and help make sure the rooms get cleaned out. Come on down this way. Whoa. So now you're entering into the People's Shores space. This is our workforce development. So you've seen the barbershop, you've seen the beauty salon. This is where individuals will come and actually have a job. The capacity is to hire about, well, over 100 people, and Michael can tell you more than I can. Um, and we're talking about data center, data entry. It, whenever you call Delta and other companies and you're talking to someone that's overseas, well, that's what this is. So rather than offshoring those jobs to other countries, we've connected with an organization that will actually hire those individuals here from within the community and train them. Everything from Microsoft Word to Excel to PowerPoint um, to Access to Mac systems and Windows systems, how to do QuickBooks, Quicken, and then, of course, all that takes place in a data center and a data entry um, position. So. This is poised to begin tomorrow. Now, we only have about 35 folks starting tomorrow, but that's a start. Amen. Amen. But we're looking to fill this with over 100 employees before the end of the year. How many know that can happen? All right. Michael Bryant is going to come and tell us a little bit more of what happens in this space. And then we're going to go inside. Good morning, everyone. All right. Actually, we're going to have 200 jobs here eventually. So we, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. So we are going to, we've been recruiting. Our career services have been helping to uh, fill these positions. All these positions, or the vast majority, are filled with, with individuals who live in this community, which was our goal. So rather than having to go elsewhere now, rather than $7, $8 an hour, they're going to start here with 15 initially, but they'll jump up in 90 days and they're beyond with the company. We're going to be working for a five finance company. Now, they won't give us their name. They want to keep that anonymous, but we do know it's a finance company that they'll be taking calls for. So the first 35 starts in about another four or five months, they're going to bring on another 50. And then at the 29th of this month, we're bringing in another major company who wants to bring other jobs here. So we, as Pastor said, we're going to be filling up real quick. The first area here is still being built. That's okay, but you're going to go through another set of doors when you get down. And that's where the smaller room Room is where they'll start tomorrow. Over to your left is a break room. There are new restrooms put up here. So, so we're ready for them to go. Come on in. All right, I know y'all in the back didn't hear that, so pass it down, pass it down. All right, we're all going to come in and go through, okay? Come on in. This is our new data center. This is what it will look like when it's done. Please come on through. Thank you. Come on in, come on in, come on in. Michael, what is the capacity of this room? Um, I don't know yet, to be honest with okay. you. But I, I know that they'll eventually, it will be for 200 folks. So, uh, and they'll be rotating shifts. This will be shifts. That's how they can get them in here. So there'll be an e evening shift and a day shift. So that's how we'll be able to get 200 folks up in here. And these are companies that are national and international. So whenever all the daylight, all the, um, uh, the standard times, Eastern, Central, and then other overseas times. So it'll be morning somewhere. And this will be a 24-hour operation as it's going to be fielding companies from around the globe. And these are major companies that um, are, are partners with us. Come on through. All right, any questions at all? No? All right. Then this, this section is ready to go tomorrow. This is the section that begins tomorrow.
please come on through. I'll stand on this side so you guys are able to come in. You can go back to this wall to allow other folks behind you to come in. Please make your way in. Please make your way in. So folks behind you will be able to come in. And you're welcome to walk all through. This is yours. This is yours. You paid for it, so come in. Put your hands on it. Pray for it. Bless it. Those of you online, thank you so much for being online with us. We're in the second space, which is going to house the first 35 individuals who will be starting work tomorrow in the morning. So they come uh, in the morning. They're going to start at $15 an hour. Now, I know that's not a lot of money for all of us, but you know what? That's a lot of money when you do not have a job. Not only do they not have a job, but many of them have no skills at all. So we are hiring from within this community. And so individuals who could not get work or had challenges getting on the bus and going way up to the north side or the south side to work or trying to go down to the airport to work, they are able to come across the street, down the street, and they can be at work. It's going to be a shift uh, situation. The first the first will begin with just day, day shift, and then we'll move to an evening shift as well. Um, they'll come in with a salary, with benefits, and training, and that all happens on the first day. They've already been vetted. They've already been hired. They're already ready to start. All the human resources have already been done, so they are ready to go. So let's uh, thank God. Yes, yes. All right. I want to make sure other folks are able to get in. So what we're going to do is, Michael, raise your hand. You're going to follow that guy with the hand raised. You're now going to see our clothing store. This is the clothing store, so you'll go right out here. Those who start work and don't have suits and dresses to wear, they'll get them from here. So we'll clothe them, train them, and pay them. Amen. 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 Thank you all. Go right on through. Yes. At the community center. So they want to come. God bless you, sir. Bless you, sir. They want to be sure they call us on any day of the week, Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. Give a call to New Life, the main number, and we'll get them situated. Yes. We have a lot of positions we need to fill. Okay. You know something. Someone pass word to Michael that he's got it from here. To the right. Go to the right. To the right. These may leave and others may enter. <laughs> Come on in. Everybody's walking so slow. <laughs> Feels like a funeral home. You know, you're just walking through the funeral home real slow. Come on through. Please don't stop at the door. Just come right on in. Come right on in. Thank you, Edna. Come on through. So this is where we'll have our 35 uh, starters tomorrow and um, go this way sir you can help fill in come on this way come on this way come on this way come on in come on in thank you thank you thank you thank you and you guys can walk on in it's okay I promise you it's all right this this area I don't know one two three four. one two three uh, four one two three four five six seven so what's four times seven 28 so 28 will be in here tomorrow and we have 35 that's starting so some folks are going to be on a different shift and so we'll do a day shift as well as an evening shift so 35 employees that begin tomorrow all of this is to be filled that's not it is huge it is huge so the electricity yes we've already upped all of the electricity look behind you that's all of our data our data systems are there. You can see all the fiber that goes up and through that feeds all of the computer stations. Georgia Power has already been up here, and they've increased our data load, which increases the monthly payments. Come on in. Come on in. This is a part of our job fair. Yes, so we are, we're filling 200 spots, but we have another company that we need to partner with that's going to have a demand for another 100 individuals to come. The first company has a 35-person demand. The second company will have a 100-person demand. We're trying to fill the 100-person spot now. Make sure she's here. Make sure she's here. 
Thank you. Come on through. Come on in a little bit closer. You can come on closer so folks behind you can get in. So what you're looking at here is what is ready to go tomorrow. This begins at, uh, thank you, Gun, it's starting at 8 o'clock in the morning. And it's our first set, so we can't, uh, we don't know the name of the company as of yet because of privacy issues. Um, but uh, there are companies like Delta, Deloitte, and Tush, and all of these other uh, organizations. And the way that this works is that those companies offshore these jobs to India and China and um, Indonesia, etc., which is a good thing. That's not a bad thing. But it takes a lot of work away from communities in America that need it. So there's an organization called People Shores that we're partnering with. And that organization used to offshore these jobs. And now they are onshoring the jobs and um, going into impoverished areas. And so these data centers exist in some of the hardest hit areas of the country, right? So there's some in uh, Little Rock, Arkansas. There's another one that's in Mississippi. There's one that's in upper New York. And they were coming to the Atlanta market and needed a place that provided wraparound services because the folks that we hire have needs more than just a job. They have other needs, everything from domestic abuse, substance abuse, you name it, there are so many other needs. So why, they didn't want to hire somebody who had a substance abuse problem and had no way to get that resolved. They're going to end up firing them. So we are handling all of the hiring for these agencies. We're vetting each person and supplying our wraparound services to them. Uh, the Community Alliance hires uh, case managers. We have a team of case managers that work. We also have a team of interns that work on individual cases, helping people move to sustainability. So as we source this with people that they will hire, they're coming in, they're getting a job, and we're able to supply services for them in every area. The only thing we can't do so far is child care. But I believe God's working that out. Yeah. We can provide child care. If we can do child care in the building, we do substance abuse in the building. We have case managers for domestic violence. We also help with food, with clothing, with haircuts, everything that you would need. We have a social security office here. Um, so all of the needs for, that, for do documentation and data, anything you can get at DFACS, you can get here. So this allows for us to manage the people that are in these jobs to make sure that they have long-term employability and not just hired for a month, mess up, and lose their jobs. At the same time, we're sourcing this with more people in the pipeline, so there's always a waiting list for work. And now, as you guys know, there's going to be a large waiting list, right? Um, and uh, any questions? All right, all right, all right. Thank you all. This is... Yes. I don't know the shifts yet. I know there are two shifts, but I don't know the times of them. I think the first shift starts at 8 in the morning. Um, there is full training. So I think for the first week, it's only training. And then on the second week, they do some work with oversight. And by week three, they're fully working. But though they start in training, they begin with a, with a, a wage, a salary. Now, it's only $15 an hour. But... $15 an hour when you have no job, that's a lot. And I know it sounds good, but we wanted 20 We really fought for $20 an hour, but 15 was the best that we could get an hour. But it's full benefits. So they have health care, uh, benefits, medical and dental and, and vision. So full benefits that they have, and they're being trained in the process. And after they're here for 120 days or so, the company that they're working for has the option to hire them on permanently at that particular location. That means they leave here and they actually go to the company to work or they stay here for another 120 days until they're ready to be hired. All right? Yes, so good question. We do not have transportation services as of yet. We have one van and we use that van for our after school program. So child care and transportation are the two things we don't have, but I believe God wants us to have it, so we will get transportation. We do offer MARTA cards, and so we'll give them MARTA fare and MARTA cards to get here. All right? If you wanted to apply, how would you get 
anyone that wants to apply, call the church office, 770-322-6262, or just find us online. Give us a call. Now, quite naturally, we have a long backlog of phone calls, so don't just call once. Call a couple of times until you get someone that can take your name. Right now, there is no waiting list as it stands today, but we have a job fair coming up next week, and that's it's going to be okay. We've not publicized this job yet. This is all from clients we already have that we have sourced this, uh, position, these positions with. Next week, we open it to the public, and when that happens, obviously, it'll be a quite a bit. All right? All right, if you would, any more questions? All right, we want others to come in, so if you go out that door and to the right, out that door and to the right, you'll, you'll be looking at our clothing store. I want you to follow them. Kenny, tell them about the clothing store. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, hey, my sis, how are you? Okay, email. Can I give you my, my email address? You have the church's